So if everyone's ready, allow me to begin. So again, hello everyone and welcome to Gail, Making Cities for People, an online webinar. My name is Nandi De La Paz. I am an architect and an educator from the De La Salle College of St. Benil Architecture Program. I'm also currently the data director of ACID. And very recently, the Royal Danish Embassy has partnered with the De La Salle College of St. Benil School of Design and Arts to organize a lecture by renowned Danish architect and urban design, designer, Jan Kael, Making Cities for People. This event is very special to our community because as present and future architects and designers in general of environments, culture developing and world changing works such as those of Jan Gale are very essential in any aspect of design. Aside from that, this live online lecture is the first of many virtual webinars to be hosted by the Benil Architecture Program. And we are so honored to be starting it with an offering from the Royal Danish Embassy. The idea of having a perfect city is not all about the spectacular architecture, nor the highly advanced technology, nor the landmarks that we create or remember. Having said that, quote unquote, the word perfect does not even exist nor is it an added value to our current era. A city is built for the people, and it should be as clear as that. Quoting and without preempting the wisdom of our speaker. Quote, nothing in this world is more simple and cheaper than making cities that provide better for people. As a trend data director, I do believe in the continuously evolving phenomena of sustainability for change. Phen phenomena of sustainability for change. This macro trend practiced in various parts of the world for years now is one of the main drivers that improves and enhances our community from personal care and well being to an efficient lifestyle and way of life. As young and seasoned designers and practitioners alike, this is what we should uphold and value in our practice to design for the people. Our esteemed guest for this afternoon co-founded Gale Architects in the year 2000 with Helle Schohold and held a partner position until the year 2011. Jan is currently a senior advisor at Gale. He also continues to research and develop the people first approach through his books and lectures. Over the course of his career, he has published several books, including Life Between Buildings, Cities for People, New City Spaces, Public Spaces, Public Life, New City Life, How to Study Public Life, and most recently, People Cities, Menesker Force. He is an honorary fellow of RIBA, Royal Institute of British Architects, the American Institute of Architects, the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, NPA. As I open this afternoon's special session, and I have just, and as I have just formally introduced our speaker, I enjoin you in giving a very warm, warm welcome to Her Excellency Grete Silasen, the ambassador of the Royal Danish Embassy to the Philippines, for the introductory remarks. Hello, everybody. I think. I'm online with everybody, and in the first place, thank you so much, Jan Gil, for joining us, for giving your time to us here. We appreciate it. 
so much. And speaking for myself, it's really an honor, but more than anything, a pleasure to introduce you here. Uh, we have been working together before. I was previously ambassador to Buenos Aires and Gale Architects have been very active there. And maybe I could ask for my first slide now. Yeah, it's coming up there because uh, other than Yen being the uh, keynote speaker at the Biennial of, uh, of Architecture of Buenos Aires, which is the biggest in Latin America, we also with Gale Architects managed to arrange the first Gale Masterclass outside of Denmark in Buenos Aires in 2016. And Jan was not there, but Jan, you would recognize the happy members of your team and also Nina and me from the embassy. And if you just move on to the next slide, it's the same poster, but you can see that we had three days there and we also had the presidency of uh, Argentina and the city of Buenos Aires involved in arranging this. And I can tell you, we had these three days that were so filled with inspiration and good vibes and love among the participants that came from seven countries of Latin America. And people really uh, left that seminar with so much inspiration that we have later on seen uh, implemented. And I will show you that. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, because you said something in your introduction that was very right, that it's not only about the big landmarks and one of the projects that Gale Architects have been doing in Buenos Aires is what you see here. In the middle of Buenos Aires, you have an urban slum of some 35,000 people. And it was right next to some posh areas. It was growing and it was becoming a problem for the city because how do you turn that around? And Gale Architects, did exactly what they do, cities for people. So going into that slum and helping upgrading it. So it's today called uh, another block uh, of the city and not just referred to as a slum. Some of the best play fields in the city are now in that area for those poor people. If you move on to the next slide. You have Wi-Fi for everybody in there, uh, which is super important. If you wanna move on, set up business. And there are many, many other examples. I can't take all of them, but it's just to show what you can do when you set people first and that you don't have to start in the posh end of the city. There are many other ways that you can put your skills into use for everybody, cities for people. And the next slide, please. Which I can't help because that was a picture that I took inside Barrio 31, as it's called now. For a Dane, of course, I'm glad to see a bike and then you have all the pots and greens uh, in there. I found this was a very optimistic image. And then the next slide, please. What is that? That is actually a protected bike lane. I was out, way out in a Northern province of Argentina and the purpose of my trip there was agriculture. Uh, and on my way to a meeting uh, with a mayor out in the province, they produce a lot of lemons, which was of interest to Denmark. I saw this bike lane and I basically asked the official driver to stop and I was hanging out of the window to take this picture. And I had my meeting with the, with the agricultural part. And then I say to the mayor, I'm very, very happy to see that you have protected bike lanes. And then he said, yeah, he had been in that seminar and he had been so inspired by it. And he had gone to Copenhagen and met up with the, with the, with the, the municipality of Copenhagen and he had gone to Gale Architects and he had gone home and say, we have to start somewhere. So there you have what you can do with the inspiration. They would look differently in Copenhagen where we have taken it some steps further, but it's just saying that with the inspiration and putting your knowledge, you as participants here, you architects and urban planners, there's so much that can be done uh, and it's not all about traffic. It's about the whole concept as Jan Gil is saying, it, making cities for people. And I think that is the biggest recommendation that I can bring to the table today before I leave the floor to Jan. I am a citizen of Copenhagen. Well, I'm not posted abroad right now, I'm sitting in Copenhagen. And it's my privilege to live in a city that has benefited for more than 40 years of the 
visions of Yan Gim because he was a visionary. He was the first mover who really saw that we needed cities for people. Copenhagen again and again topped the list now, tops the list of most livable cities. And therefore my recommendation is to be a citizen of one of those livable cities is a privilege. And I hope that all of you that are listening in today will go out and put it into practice. It can be done anywhere and you will have very thankful citizens when things improve. So with that introduction, uh, again, thank you, Yen, for being with us today. I'll leave the floor to you. I will try to share my screen. <clears throat> Does it work out there? Yes, yeah, it's working perfectly. We can we Excellent. can see the screen and we can see you. Yes, excellent. Excellent. Begin. <clears throat> First and foremost, I will say <clears throat> good afternoon to all of you down there in the Philippines, and thank you for the very kind introduction and welcome, and a special thanks also to the Danish ambassador, Grete Willesen, Willes, Silesen, thanking you for this interesting insight in the work where I was not present in, in Buenos Aires, but which I think is a very important work. And I was very happy to have this glimpse of it. Now I'll tell you some wider story, how it all came about and give you an update to the subject of how to make livable cities for the 21st century. <clears throat> we have to go back some time and we have to look at the past 50 years. And if we look closely at the cities of the past 50 years, we can see that we have done whatever we could do to harass the people and chase the people out of the cities. The background, before these things happened, we had what could be termed the good old days of city planning. That was a time when cities all over the world, in Japan, Sweden, in Canada, and Italy, all over, they looked more or less like this. And these were cities which were made by people, for people, observing human scale and observing the way people move around in cities. That was how all the cities looked like. Then came two great earthquakes in city planning. One was the modernism that instead of building cities, while well, we were to build individual buildings and we have to separate all the functions. And also the car invasion started to be really bad around the world. If we go back to before the modernism, all, city, all cities were focused on the spaces. The spaces made up the cities and all the things which happened in the cities happened in these spaces. People could move from one place to another. They could meet each other. There could be market, there could be ceremony, there could be um, traditional activities. Everything could happen in the spaces. Then with the modernism, the whole thing moved from the city as an organi organism onto various functions. And the whole focus moved from the spaces of the city to the objects. This is the Corbusier's suggestion for how Paris could be much better. You should take down the entire Paris and build 24 high rise buildings from where the citizens could see their lovely city. This is the kind of, of thinking 
which goes with the modernism. You build the buildings and what is not built upon with buildings that is leftover space. That is completely different from the old concept of spaces for people in the city. If you look at the older cities, what you can remember are the spaces. You can remember the streets and squares and parks and a few important buildings, maybe the cathedral, the town hall, the king's castle, whatever. In modern cities, they are constituted, constitu they, they are up of a number of singular buildings, often in very funny shapes. That's what you remember. You remember no spaces from the modern cities because the spaces were never something which the city planners and architects cared about in the days of the modernism. Form must follow function, fashion, and the architects, they all of them competed on who could make the most funny shape. Not that the quality of the life would be better with a funny shape, but that was the way people conceived architecture and the way architects have been working now for quite a bit of time. What happened with the modernism, and it's really important because this was really a fantastic manipulation with the way we live in cities. It was as if the planners and architects went up in aeroplanes and everything was done from five kilometers up in the air where the objects were put down. Also in the site plan scale where the site planners, they were moving sort of in helicopters over the objects and adjusted the patterns but down in the where people were at eye level, nobody looked after that scale. And that had very, very serious consequences for the people. The result of this way of planning was really a goodbye to concern for people. People were left in the leftover spaces to fend for themselves in endless and hilariously poor uh, environments, as you can see these examples. Another thing which happened with this shift from making spaces to making objects was a goodbye to human scale. In the old days, we knew perfectly about what human scale was, what a comfortable scale for people was. But then with modernism, we were able to make enormous distances between buildings and make huge buildings and people were floating now more or less around in these spaces. Also today, I do think that many architects and planners have, are very confused when it comes to scale because of this transformation from human scale to I do not know what kind of scale we can call these new cities. The other thing which happened in the same period, that was a car invasion. It again, I take 1960 as a time when this really started to unfold. And again, with the car invasion over the past 50 years, the people have gradually been chased out of the cities. Here is a little reminder of what has happened. This is from Copenhagen. This is a scene from 1905. And you can see that at that time, the people commanded the scenery People are walking freely in all directions across the square in front of the Royal Theatre in Copenhagen. And there only has arrived one car, no problem. There's also a tram and a horse-drawn horse, horse -drawn cart, but it is a people city. After just a few years, we start to see the problem. Here is a poster saying the automobile arrives and it shows how people are chased out to save their lives. It got worse and worse and worse until finally the cars more or less in many places have taken over the, the spaces and the dignity of man is not at all to be respected. All over the world, people are treated very badly by the traffic in the cities. Here it's a little scenery from Romania, Bucharest, a few problems here. 
But I would say that the more problematic conditions are found in the developing countries where uh, the planning has been weaker and the market forces stronger, the survival of the fittest. That is in the streets and also on the sidewalks where you can see that the space for people are very limited and there's not room enough for all the things which are reasonable to see happening in the city. Also with the arrival of the motor car, we had another serious attack on our knowledge about scale. Because in the old days, all the cities were five kilometers an hour scale. And in the five kilometer, when we move slowly, when we walk, we can make small spaces. We don't need much space. We can see small signals. We can see people. We can see details. We can see a fantastic amount of valuable sense impressions. If we start to move in the cities with 60 kilometers an hour, it's a completely other scenery. Now the spaces have to be huge to accommodate the cars and the signs have to be huge. You can see no details, so no details are made in the buildings and you can see no people. And this has actually become the scale of all the modern cities and of the suburbs. This is from an, of course, from an American suburb, but now this 60 kilometer an hour scale is very dominating in the newer city districts worldwide. It's a scale for the cars. Further confusion about good scale for people, good scale for cars. If you ask me, I think it's high time to win back the cities for people and there will be a lot of advantages involved in this. I'll go back again to 1960. I said that both the modernism and the car invasion, they really started in the big way in the 1960, when after the Second World War, again, the economies of the world started to roll. And that was when all these things started. And then we can ask what was known about quality for people in relation to city planning at that point. Actually, we knew virtually nothing. And then, of course, a counter movement started. And it started the really, the first strong voice heard was from New York, where Jane Jacobs, an architectural journalist, living in Greenwich Village um, started to assemble the inhabitants of Greenwich Village and other districts in, in Manhattan to fight for the preservation of the good housing, uh, good city districts in Manhattan. The planner, Robert Moses and the other New York planners, they wanted to modernize New York like Corbusier wanted to modernize Paris, they wanted to modernize New York, and to do that, they had to take down all the old neighborhoods, Greenwich Village, Little Italy, Chinatown, Soho, Tribeca, they must all go, they were redundant. Instead, there should be some huge freeway going across Manhattan, and along the freeway should be rows of high-rise buildings. That was the idea, that was the plan, but Jane Jacobs and the other citizens, they were able to stop the plans after serious infight. Jane Jacobs, she actually put down all she learned from this the battle. She put it down in the famous book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, which came out in 1961. In this one, she put down that if the modernists and the motorists are to plan our cities, it will not be great cities, it will be dead cities. And she also said to planners and architects around the world, do look out of the windows and see how life really is going on. Instead of sit in your studios and make, and make philosophies about what people should do or must do and ought to do, look out and see how life is and how our built environment influence life, look out of the window. My own story is very much, <clears throat> is, 
is inscribed in the overall story of the counter-modernism and counter-motorism movement started by Jane Jacobs. I graduated as an architect in 1960. It's exactly 60 years ago. And as a matter of fact, I've been a full-time architect now for 60 years. And it's been a wonderful journey, I can tell you. I was trained in the 50s. And what did we do in architecture schools in the 50s? We spent all the days hanging over models five kilometers up in the air and putting objects down and making interesting patterns. And when we had a nice composition of objects, we will step back and say, gee, this is a nice town. A nice city at that time was something which looks great from the airplane and great from the freeway. But whether it was nice to live there, that was not really discussed. I went out of school of architecture, fired up with all these new modernistic ideas. Now I should do wonderful things for mankind. I should carry out all these new philosophies. And then I married a psychologist. And then, of course, we started in our family, in our household, to have new discussions. Young architects and young psychologists met. And all the time, we architects were under fire, being asked, why are you not, as architects, interested in people? Why don't they teach you anything about people in school of architecture? Why do you think that aesthetics is the most important things in life? That's only one of many important things. And you should observe a wider range of things and make realize that whatever you do, you manipulate with people. This, of course, was very strong words to hear from a, for a young architect. And in my case, I had to go back to School of Architecture to study for an extra 40 years. And of course, my purpose was to hear about people or to hear what they didn't tell me when I was in School of Architecture the first time. But that was only to find out that at that time, nothing was known about how the physical environment influenced on the quality of life for people, influence, uh, the, influ the, the interaction between life and form, nothing was known. So my, I sat down to try to make the people who used our architecture, our cities, to make them visible so that we can start to discuss how is the built environment influencing the life. What I did actually for 40 years was I sat on my behind and I just watched and watched and watched. I sat there with myself and I sat there with students and teams of researchers. And after a while, we started to be able to expand the studies to all corners of the world, to all climates, to all cultures, from Greenland to New Zealand, from South Africa, uh, Japan, you name it. We have been studying in all these places and put together all these observations. Gradually, we, we gathered observations also from various times of the year and, and various weather situations, whatever. Lots of information was, uh, was uh, put together and systematized. And I'll just show you a couple of examples of these little studies which we put together in great numbers. This is the School of Architecture in Copenhagen. The school moved from, the, from one location to another location in an old army barracks. And they asked a landscape architect to come in and make a wonderful landscaping. He did these wonderful lawns with an, 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 a rusty iron edge, as is the custom nowadays. And it was all very fine. You can see in the foreground at the right is a corner. And that is where the students enter School of Architecture. And in the background, you can see a building. What is in the building? That's where. That's a canteen where you can have coffee. And what happens when students can see where they can have coffee? They go for the coffee. 
They don't go around the landscape architects. Landscaping people are not used to go in right angles. They save energy whenever they can. So two weeks later, the landscape architect had to come back and finish his project. He didn't realize that from the very start, he could have known that architects, your students, they head for the coffee directly and don't go outside the landscaping to get the coffee. Another example is the edge effect we found by observing where people were, were waiting uh, in public spaces that they really prefer to stay at the edge. You, one example could be the ballroom where the music is high and you go and dance in the middle. But when there is a break in the music, you go out to the edge and it's called, the people sitting there called wallflowers actually. But this sitting by the edge is very, very common. And that of course is based on the human senses, which are all our senses are in the front. If we sit at the edge, our back is covered, our senses are out front, and we can completely control the situation and we can follow everything happening. That's a very nice place. To are there any problems? Uh, you may you may proceed, yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry? You may you may proceed. Okay, edge yeah. effect that we found that all over the world because that goes with homo sapiens and the way our senses are organized. Then we started to think maybe architects are different from ordinary people. And then we decided to study behavior of architects. We went to a number of architecture schools to see where the architecture students would like to sit. And we found much to our surprise that architecture students were sitting exactly as everybody else in the world. So we could conclude that architects were more or less just like other people. But if architects are like ordinary people, who designed places like this, you may ask. I can give you a guarantee that nobody would sit here voluntarily unless they are very, very tired. And if you do this kind of thing, then make sure to bring some bronze people so that the place will be used because ordinary people would not like to sit in a location like that. All these things we studied for years and years and many, many other things put together, systematized it, and then we started to put it down in books. This is the first book, 1971, it is Next year, it will be 50 years ago, that was my PhD thesis, uh, where first time I raised the question that the buildings actually influence life a lot. And that gradually, to my su surprise, I realized that it was beginning to be distributed over the world. And of course, I realized now that at that time, nothing was known. And when something somebody started to put some knowledge down in a book. It was really something which was asked for. There was a big hunger for information. So the, the knowledge, the research started to be widespread. Many years later, actually 40 years later, I was asked to put down everything I have collected in my 40 years of research in one book. And it was a foundation in Denmark who asked me to do it. And they say, put everything down in one book while you can still remember it. We will pay for it. So we produced the book, Cities for People, which should be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, as we knew it at that point. That was 10 years ago. And in just the 10 years which has passed since, this little book has been now published in 35 languages, a number of new countries are queuing up. And of course, if you see this map of the world with the book, it's not because it's a fantastic book, but it's because there's a great hunger for making cities better for people to humanize cities. There's also a hunger to make revolt against modernism, 
and the introduction and the invasion of the motor car that is worldwide that is why such a thing is spread very quickly next version will be next month in or actually this month in Myanmar and just yesterday I got the news version which will be in Turkey so it's still coming out in new places because everybody is interested in humanizing cities. I'm so proud to realize now that all my books, one after one after one, have been published in China. Actually, they started 25 years ago and they all six of them are published in China. What I'm not so happy about is the fact that I realized that they never really had time to read the books over there. But maybe they will find time and maybe gradually also modernism will stop being the major mode of new construction in China. The people need something which is much more people oriented. If I shall sum up after all these 50 years of research, we now know how to make fine cities for people. There is enough studies made starting with Jane Jacobs and going down in all these years. All these things have been studied. The built environment has an enormous influence on the life of people. You manipulate with people with whatever you do. You better know about how you manipulate and you better know about what you can do to make the cities fit the people instead of making the people forced to fit whatever cities you make. If we shall sum up, <clears throat> we can say in this way that first we form the cities, but then they form us. We better know something about how we should form the cities so that they are adapting to the people and not the people adapting to the cities. <clears throat> While all this research has been going on, in the meantime, we have had an, a series of more important or new, new challenges for us as city planners. Some are old and some are new. The old one is that we really want lively, livable cities, cities which accommodate people's daily lives and quality of life. The sustainable city is very important, healthy city, good cities to be old in are some of the present challenges. The old demand, the one which was thrown out by the modernists, and we have had very great difficulties in winning this back. That is to have spaces for people to walk and to meet, to reestablish the spaces which constitute the cities and the meeting place for men. People have throughout history been attraction number one in the cities, but also it's attraction number one in our lives. And we really here in the COVID pand pandemia time can see when we have this empty city, how much we look forward to having lively, livable cities again. That life is very important for quality and for the concept of quality. You can see whenever architects hand in projects, they will invariably fill the, the drawings with endless number of happy people playing trumpet and whatever they do, which is not out of, which is out of the normal. But all this life and activity signalizes to the viewer that this is a nice place these people would never be here if it wasn't a nice place. If it was not nice, they will go home immediately. So the fact that they are here must mean that this is a nice project. We call it people washing because the project is not necessarily nice just because you put in a lot of people on your drawings. Increasingly, we realize that one of the greatest problems in city planning today is to address the climate 
challenge. We must make much more sustainable cities. And of course, if people use their own energy, if we walk more and cycle more, that will be the better for the climate. But also we realize that we will have to find much more sustainable ways of transportation and mobility. Public transport will play a growing role and already plays a growing role in cities across the world. And to have good public transportation, you also need good public rail. So these goes well together. Other new challenges are the challenge from which is which we have from the doctors and they call it the sitting syndrome and they point out that for 50 years we as city planners have basically made everything we could to make people sit and sit and sit and now they say it's essentially that you change the city planning so that you invite people to move more and sit less. It's now a really serious problem. In the United States, many parts of the states, more than 35% of all the people are seriously overweight and are lacking. Uh, they, they, um, yeah, they, they, um, they, there are more people now dying of, of of sitting syndrome then um, it was almost like in the bad period of the I'll just put the lights on again there we go if you make cities so that you have just one hour of moderate exercise every day you can expect to live seven years longer and your life will be much more uh, much better quality and also, it would be much cheaper for the society if you do this. Also, we can see that the World Health Organization today, they have a global action plan, say, introduce transport policies where you promote active and safe methods of traveling, such as walking and bicycling. Another thing which is changing in the world today in many countries are that the number of elderly people in our cities are increasing very much. That means that we will have to take much more account to make it good cities also to be old in. But all the time we should of course have looked after it being good for every generation. If we look carefully after the people in city planning, we realize that we will efficiently address all these four issues. Then we can ask the question, are there any cities which will say here everything will be done to invite people to walk and bicycle as much as possible in the course of their daily day? It's not about weekends, not about holidays, but it's about every day, Monday, Tuesday and so on, the daily day. And actually, cities all over the world are now full speed working to this agenda. I will invite you to a few of the cities where I have worked myself in the years when I did a lot of consulting to cities where this research we did through all these 40 years were transformed into action and where cities were transformed. First you make the research, then you can change the mindset and with a changed mindset, you can start to change the cities. Here we are in Melbourne, 1985. Melbourne was really awful. Everybody had given up the city. It was just another sort of North American city, full of offices, no life, no residences, all empty at night and in weekends. But in Melbourne, they decided to revitalize the cities. They had a firm policy in Melbourne, we walk. And to be sure that people had the invitation to walk, they widened all the sidewalk. They put granite on all the sidewalk. They put trees so you could walk in shade. They put a fantastic furniture, street furniture program. They did whatever you could to make it comfortable to walk. And they have now achieved that the walking 
people walk a lot in Melbourne and they put constraints to the to the automobile traffic. And actually, Melbourne is now by far the best city in the Southern Hemisphere. It's on top of all the lists of livable cities in the world. When Copenhagen is not on top, you could be sure Melbourne is. And I say that Melbourne now is really having a street life and the ambience of something which gives you an idea of Paris. But in Melbourne, the climate is considerably better. So if I should give you a little bit of advice, move to Melbourne, because that has become a very nice city by a fabulous effort by the, especially the city architect, Rob Adams, with whom I work now for 25 years. Melbourne also have, of course, introduced a bicycle system and they call it the Copenhagen style bicycle lanes. That is where the park cars protect the bicycles instead of having the bicycles protect the park cars. Another city where I worked, Sydney, started in 2006. Sydney is famous for its wonderful waterfront, but the city center is really awful. It's full of cars and buses and fumes and congestion. And it's been very hard work to push these things out of the city center. But now, finally, we've come around to doing just that. Here is the main street of Sydney, George Street, before. And now in 2019, it was opened as a pedestrian street with a light rail going up and down through the city from one end to the other. A completely different situation in Sydney. Also in Sydney, of course, they have full speed in doing bicycle lanes in a complete citywide system. In New York, they heard about the other cities and they came to Copenhagen to see what was going on in Copenhagen and said, we want a city like this one. When can you come? So we went to New York and was employed by Mayor Michael Bloomberg and Jeanette Sadiq Khan to humanize New York, to make better public spaces and introduce a bicycle culture in New York. You've already heard about the, the Times Square project. That's just one of them. <clears throat> we were able to prove that the majority of people in Times Square, they were really squeezed on the sidewalks, while 10% of the people used 90% of the space for the cars. And that was the beginning of finding out that they could close Broadway, we could win back a lot of asphalt from the motor cars, and that was done. And now in New York, it was Times Square in 2009, and immediately it was taken over by people. And now they have 50 squares like this all over New York. And also in New York, of course, one of the major things of making New York more sustainable was to go for a bicycle system so that instead of commuting by cars, you could start to use metro, you could walk, and you could bicycle. Another project in another part of the world I would like to show here, that is the work we did around 2005-7 in Amman in Jordan, where a number of places were transformed from funny, derelict, uh, confusing places into firm people-oriented spaces for people to have possibilities to have fresh air and recreation. Also, you don't have to be very extremely radical and make completely new spaces. You can also, of course, just clean up after the car invasion as here in Bogota, Colombia, done by Mayor Enrique Peñalosa in 2001. And also in, in, from Bogota in Colombia, we could be inspired by knowing about their fantastic ciclovia in the Sundays. They don't use all the streets so much on the Sundays, 
So they convert them into streets for cycles and for running and for people activities, 120 kilometers every Sunday. And a lot of people use this Ciclovia idea every Sunday. This idea is now spread many, many places because it's very widespread that the, that the streets are not used so much on the Sundays as in the other days. <clears throat> many cities are now into all this humanization of the cities. Here's a mayor of Vilnius in Lithuania going around telling people discreetly, do not park in my bike lanes. And here is Bucharest again, but now they've just got my book down there. So I'm sure they can sort out this little traffic congestion. We'll see. I'll invite you finally to Moscow. I was at a conference and told about these other cities and the vice mayor from Moscow came galloping up to me and said, we shall, we will need to humanize Moscow. When can you come? So we went to Moscow and we were shocked right away. It was in 2012. And at that time, the city was completely swamped by cars. There were no parking rules and there were rather loose traffic rules. And the cars were all over on the sidewalks, in the parks, on the boulevards, everywhere, on the steps, on the monuments, cars, 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 and hardly any room for people. We were asked, here is another example, that's just a little side street, have a nice time here, enjoy. And this is Main Street, Moscow. Of course, they had not enough places to put the cars, so they took out spaces from the sidewalk on Main Street, Moscow. Moscow is a city of 14 million, and the Main Street there was left one meter for the people to walk up and down on the Main Street. That was in 2011, 2012. Now started a process of winning back the cities where we had the pleasure to be advisor to the city government of Moscow. And in this con context, <clears throat> I of course was, I was meeting up with the mayor, Sergei Sobyanin, and he would ask, what will you point out we shall do in Moscow? And I gently told him that of course, this idea of parking on the sidewalk is not a very good idea. And we will have to point out that there's no room for people and then you've taken over all the sidewalks. The cars will have to come by. Now in Russia, in Moscow, they have a very efficient democracy. So when I visited next time, there were no cars parked on the sidewalk, which shows the efficiency and the determination to do something. And also if some people should forget about the new rule, the mayor had some little orange cars which went around and picked up your cars, very efficient way of telling you not to park here. Then started a process with fabulous changes in Moscow. I've never seen a city doing so much in such a short time this is Main Street, Moscow in 2011. Just two years later, the cars have gone. Instead, you have benches all the way. The gray street are beginning to be a green street and all the advertisements in the sky has disappeared. So you can see all the way through the street to the Kremlin in the distance. Here's the side street to the Main Street. And you can see how bad the people were faring in 2011 and how nicely it is organized by now. Here's one of the squares along the main street, Pushkin Square. Over the years, so many objects had drifted in and settled on this square that there was no square here any, anymore. Now it's all cleaned up. They've got new granite pavement. You can find the metro station. They've got street trees, sidewalk cafes, it's a completely other story than the mess of 211. They've done many, many things. And when I was last 
in Moscow, I was approached by some people saying, hey, Jan, what, see what you have done here. We now have a serious new problem, the Moscow baby boom. And we blame it on the humanistic city planning. You put up all these benches, you took the cars out of the parks, you put up swings so that people could have a good time in the city. So many things were done that people could reconquer the city, but now we have the baby boom. It's your fault. And mind you, I'm quite happy if humanistic city planning can be the reason for a baby boom in Moscow. I shall end this tour of various cities to tell about my home city and also the home city of the ambassador in, in Manila, Grete Silesen. That's Copenhagen. Copenhagen is really a first mover in this humanization of cities policies. They've been at it now for 58 years and they've done quite a bit and I'll show you some of the things. They started really, really early. The first street in Copenhagen was cleared of traffic of pedestrianized in 1962. That's really many years ago. That was the same time as Jane Jacob was writing her book in New York. In Copenhagen, the city government removed the car in the main street and at once the people took over the space and started to slow down. They started to promenade. They started to behave like Italians instead of being harassed Nordic people as it was before on the narrow sidewalks. Copenhagen was like all other European cities at that time. All the squares in Copenhagen were used for parking. All the squares have now been taken over and given to people use. All the waterfronts so locations were used for parking. Now all the parking on the waterfronts have gone and many of the places are given completely over to public life and people so they can enjoy their city instead of the cars could enjoy it earlier. What is very important of Copenhagen and to understand the reason why Copenhagen has been transformed so much is the fact that Copenhagen became the first city in the world where the people who used the city were systematically studied and there was made reports about how the city used to study the city. And this, all this knowledge about how people were using the city was published and made available to the politicians and the city planners and the population. And that led to a much more conscious concern about the people side of the story. Earlier on, it was only the traffic engineers who have counted all the cars. Now in the university, we also had counted all the people and we knew a lot about how people were using the city. And as you know, there's an old saying saying, what you count, you care for. And Copenhagen became the first city in the world where the people was counted and they started to care for the, for the, for the people just as much as the traffic engineers cared for the cars. <clears throat> In 1962, it was one street. The same scenery today, downtown Copenhagen, you can see all these places which are now transformed, either pedestrianized or conditions for people made much better, really an invitation for people to use the city. And we've been able to prove that every year there will be more life in the city because of all these new opportunities to enjoy and unfold and meet each other. Copenhagen it really works on a vision about where the, we, we like the city to be 10, 20, 30 years from now. They have these strategies. We will be the best city in the world for people. And five years from now, we shall be here. 10 years, we shall be here. And by 230, there shall be no sale of, of cars using fossil fuel. Um, just 10 years from now, they have these ambitions. And you, it's very, very good idea to have strategies. It's much better than just having projects. 
some examples of these new strategies, which now it's not the city center, it's not where the tourists come and where people shop, it is for the whole city. And you can see many signs of it all over the city. One of them being the old city streets were asphalt from side to side, no side bicycle lanes. The new, the same streets have been transformed, all of them. Now there are two lanes, one in either direction, a good median in the middle. There are street trees, there are bicycle lanes, there are sidewalks. The lower street here is much more beautiful. It's much more safe. And it can take the same number of cars as could the other street on top because the traffic engineers now are much more smart than they were 30 years ago. Another item we can find in Copenhagen is the idea that sidewalks and bike lanes should be continuous. They should not stop every time a little street runs into another street. You should, as a principal, have continuous possibility to move on foot and to move on bicycle and the cars should be respecting the people rather than the people respecting the car which of course is very good for handicapped people and generally for the dignity of man but in my case I'm especially happy because my grandchild Laura who is seven she can now walk to school herself because she can stay on an unbroken sidewalk all the way from her house to the school door. Also in Copenhagen, they have done much to invite bicycling. By now there is a complete bicycle network and these are good bicycle lanes with a curb to the traffic and a curb to the, to the sidewalk and they are wide to allow for all generations to do the bicycling. This bicycle system of good bicycle lanes, of course, has given rise to a really alternative, efficient citywide transportation system. You can transport everything. You don't need a car. You can, the, every third family in Copenhagen has a cargo bike where you can bring your kids around. Also a good bicycle system, a good transport alternative to the car system based on bicycles will need that the bicycle transportation is integrated with the public transportation. So you can bicycle to the station, take your car on the train, and then when you arrive in the other end, you can bike to your destination. That is widespread in Copenhagen, extremely popular and free to use. Also, they have the policy, it should always be quicker to take your bicycle than to check your car because they made many shortcuts, bridges over the river and so forth. <clears throat> step by step, really a bicycle culture has developed. Everybody bikes, businessmen, pregnant women, children. The royal family is bicycling. The children are bicycling. And even the babies are being bicycled and if you are too old to bicycle, you can be bicycled. They have this bicycling without age movement where people go around to nursery homes and, and invite the old people uh, for bike rides in their old district, which is very, very popular. Also in the area of bicycling, the city of Copenhagen operates with a number of strategies to 2011 strategy, we shall be the best city in the world for bicycling, outlining what steps to take and when to take them and what order to take them and where we should be. Most of these strategies, the city is actually ahead of the strategies at this point. So finally, one can conclude here that an impressive culture of using bicycle has gradually been evolving in Copenhagen. In 2018, it was found that 49% of everybody going to work and, and studies, they were commuting to these places on the bicycles. 10 years ago, it was 38%. What have we learned from Copenhagen and from the other places, cities, small and big, where these 
principles has been applied. We have learned clearly that in each city you get what you invite for. If you invite more carefully for people to walk, for public life to unfold, and for people to bicycle, we have found that there will be much more walking, much more bi public life, and much more bicycling. That is, of course, an alternative to what we already knew, that if you invite for more driving in cars, you will have more traffic. We have alternatives to that. We have the people-oriented city planning. Now, summing up, if we make city people cities our first priority, what could what will be the benefits? It is the simplest and the cheapest thing you can do in any part of the world. And it will be much better cities for everyone in the population. And it is something which cities in all parts of the world, regardless of economic situation, can do. And finally, you can start tomorrow. I wish you good luck in studying these methods and studying these examples. And if you need more information in detail, I have not one, but actually by now there are seven books in English out there where you can find them in the library and where you can find all the information about how to do this people-oriented city planning. Good luck down there in the Philippines. Thank you.